Welcome to the Plant Spirit Podcast on connecting with plant consciousness and the healing wisdom of nature. I'm your host, Sarah Artemisia, and I'm excited to introduce our next guest to the show today. Ian White is the founder and CEO of Australian Bush Flower Essences. As a fifth generation Australian herbalist, Ian has also been a naturopath for over 40 years, and he spent over 35 years traveling all over Australia to research and develop a range of 69 specific bush essences. Ian is also the author of five major books, and he runs workshops on the bush essences in over 30 countries throughout the entire world. So Ian, thank you so much for being here. Just incredible, the work that you do with the plants and the flowers. And I'm really excited for our conversation today. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to be able to talk to someone who loves flowers as as much as I do. (laughs) Totally. Yes. Love the flowers so, so much. And clearly you are so connected with them, with with the healing gifts of the flowers, with the plants in your life's work. And particularly as someone who is a fifth generation herbalist, recognizing that you have been connected with plants your entire life. I'm curious why flower essences, why is this a modality that you feel so called to work with at this time? Yes. Well, as a young boy, I grew up in the bush just outside of Sydney, living next door to my grandmother. So I'd spend a lot of the time wandering through the bush and helping her collect the herbs that she was working with. And you know, she'd point out the various plants and see them in, you know, flowering state, non-flowering, talking about what their qualities were. So I think from a, an early age, I was just surrounded with flowers and plants. And the other thing I remember was helping her make up all the tinctures and fluid extracts was brown bottles everywhere. Interesting that fast forward, you know, all these years, I'm still surrounded by flowers and little brown bottles everywhere. So I think that was just my upbringing. My playground was the bush, you know, like I, we'd come home from the school, uh, my property and my grandmother's property is backed onto National Park. So I get out of the car at the gate and just be wandering out in the bush till it got dark and come in for dinner. So it was just like being surrounded by the plants and flowers was, um, was a great gift to grow up that way. Incredible. And so then how did you specifically start making and working with flower essences? Well, unfortunately, my grandmother, when I was about eight, she'd gone off traveling to Europe and she got separated from her herbs and unbeknown to me that she was riddled with cancer and had been when I was born. And she kept it at bay with a lot of herbs. There were three Australian plants and she also had phytolacca and sorrel. I'm sure all the American listeners would certainly know the fight of lacquer there. And being separated from the luggage, my dad had to, who was also a herbalist and pharmacist, he had to go and collect all the plants that she needed and get the extracts and get it across to her. And by the time she got it, the cancer really taken its toll. She went into a coma, was flown back to Australia, but died very quickly and nothing was written down. And there was just a a few diaries where she'd made notes about some of the plants and some of her tinctures and what have you. And my dad was more in the North American European herbal tradition. So he hadn't been doing the research on Australian plants. So unfortunately, a lot of that knowledge was lost. And, you know, I went off to university, not really sure where I was going. I started doing a a psychology degree. I got very sick traveling in India during the holidays. And I came back emotionally, physically in a real mess. And I started working with herbs to rebuild my health. And it got me really interested in natural healing. And I tried to combine, I I was doing a science degree. I brought in a lot more anatomy, physiology. And I realized I was really more interested in the natural therapy. So then I finished my degree and did my three-year training as a naturopath. And that's when we got exposed to, you know, the English bark flowers this is back in the 70s. So there was, you know, and I was thinking, oh, great. I really liked that. It was really simple, safe. Anyone could use them. And I probably started off more as a homeopath when I started my healing path. And I would still use the flower essences, but I was thinking, why isn't someone working with Australian plants? Because I'd, you know, being brought up, I knew from my grandmother all this healing quality in the plants. And 
a good dear friend I shared a house with when a student he was diagnosed with cancer he was early 30s successful in his career charismatic I mean the last person you'd think would have cancer and as well as rebuilding my health with herbs it led me into sort of tai chi yoga meditation so he asked me if I'd hold a healing circle for all our mutual friends to direct a bit of energy before they operate the next day so we all did that and, you know, they operated the next day and found out his body was full of cancer. There was nothing they could do. So I kept the healing circle weekly. And my friend Jim, who had the cancer, you know, open up to anyone who needs it. So we're doing that weekly. And shortly, like the week after he died in the meditation, I started, I got a picture of a flower, told what its healing qualities and where I had to make it. And it was flannel flower. And I knew this plant very well i've seen it a lot in the bush but they're very specific where i had to go and make it up and i thought oh, i've never seen it there and i went there and the whole area was covered in flannel flowers and i started in the meditation starting getting these messages and i'm not overly visual i'm more audio like i feel things and kinesthetic so get these visual things was very strong and if i didn't know the flower that they were showing me, there'd be a little caption underneath with the botanic name. So I was like, oh, wow, this is like, here was all this information. And my practice was already established then as a naturopath. And I'd find that if I made an essence that morning, that patients coming into me in that afternoon, even those who booked in you know, like a month before I'd actually made it, they all needed that essence. So it was this lovely synchronicity showing me I was on the right track. It also gave me the opportunity to see how the remedies were working on people. And I was getting really great results rather than giving the essences for, say, for a month, four times a day. I could give it twice a day for two days. So I started giving all the essences that, you know, after about a year, you know, developing and getting good results myself. I gave them to friends who are doctors or acupuncturists, herbalists for them to use, see if they were getting the same results that I was. And um, I think for the first two years, I was just driven. I was just like, if I wasn't seeing patients, I was just out in the bush walking and getting messages. And it was a very exciting time. And, you know, I think at one point I was told there'd be 50 remedies. This was after about six years. And I, I thought I got my 50 and nothing happened for four years. And I thought, oh, that's it. No more. And then a whole, I just mentioned the introduction, there's 69 plants from all different parts of Australia. So I don't grow any. I always prefer to go out into wilderness area where it's pristine that there's no chemicals there's no roads and things like that and I think the nice thing in many parts of Australia where I go that there hasn't been a history of psychic pollution like I teach in Europe and sometimes you're teaching in a in France or Germany and just up the road there's been horrendous battles in the first or second world war and tens of thousands of people killed violently and and energetically you feel that so you know it's nice that I the plants have to be strong to survive, especially in Australia. We go from the cycle of, you know, droughts broken by floods. And, you know, so for the plants to survive in that environment, they have to be quite hardy. That's why I like to make them in the wild. And, um, yeah, so it's really being guided and directed to when the flowers. And it's really when they're ready. Because sometimes, like growing up in the bush, there's one called Sydney Rose. And... My grandmother loved this flower. We were walking. I'm a four-year-old boy. And we came across a patch of it. And she was so excited because she hadn't seen any for a while. And she thought it was, you know, maybe extinct. And I remember her excitement. So I went back there, you know, later that day. And I picked all I could find to give to my mum. You know, you give flowers to your mum. And, and my grandmother came for dinner that night. And she walked in and she saw the Sydney rose in the vases. And she's glared at me i've never seen her be really angry with me before and said to my mother where do these come from and my mum was cooking clattering pans didn't really hear the tone of a voice oh yes uh, ian got them for me weren't they aren't they really lovely and my grandmother glared at me again and so when i thought when i was making the essence oh sydney rose this will be you know one of the first ones made but it didn't come through for about 10 years and it's very much when the flowers are ready rather than when we think, oh, you know, I've got nothing to do on it before I'll go and make them a flower essence. It's, it's really listening to when they want to communicate to us and when they're ready. Yes. So powerful. I love that you just brought that up about the listening aspect and how important that is in the collaboration with plants in this kind of a way. So powerful. And 
really so incredibly powerful how they came into your awareness like that and have been working with you in that way. And that story that you just shared about your grandmother and the Sydney Rose, I was thinking earlier when you were sharing about working with these wild plants in the pristine environments, also how amazing it is with the flower essences that we don't actually have to harvest a lot of plant material and how incredible that is for working with the more endangered plants, because we can still connect with their medicine, with their medicinal healing gifts without needing to actually take the physical plant and just how incredible that is. So thank you for sharing that. I was just going to say on that, we, I've had letters from farmers in Australia saying they were going to clear some of the bush area, you know, to, to the plant more crops and what have you. And they've heard out that, you know, in, in there, the flowers have got all these healing qualities. And they've said, I'm just going to maintain this natural virgin bush because I'm sure there's really great healing qualities in there. So not only do, as you said, we don't need to pick acres and acres of plant to make like echinacea or golden seal, which are getting, you know, harder and hard to find. We just need a, a small amount. So it, it's, yeah, it's, it's not having a negative impact at all on the environment. Amazing. Yeah. So important. And I'm curious, particularly with your connection with the bush essences, specifically your long roots in that area and your connection with the plants there. Are there any particular flower essences that you are feeling really coming forward to support with what's happening collectively at this time? <laughs> that, um, Two and a half years ago, it would seem like half of Australia was on fire. It was probably the worst summer for bushfires we ever had. It was a, a real disaster. There were, you know, hundreds of people died. There were not only people, but like it's estimated we lost three billion animals in Australia from bushfires. It was, um, you know, thousands of homes and the smoke and the trauma people had and it wasn't just restricted to Australia I was getting emails from people you know in Europe in South America and there was this really tangible fear of of mother nature what was how impotent we were dealing with you know like the fury of nature if you like or what was happening environmentally and that the anxiety that people were feeling and I think that universal anxiety, grief, trauma of seeing so many beautiful animals killed like that. And there was one of the remedies I work with, it's called Mula Mula, and it grows in the, in the centre of Australia, probably the hottest part of Australia. And when I first started getting the message with this plant, I was told it was for fear of fire or hot objects. And at that time, I was told there'd be 50 remedies. And I thought, oh, great. There'll be 49 great remedies and be more and more, which is a bit useless. Fear of fire or hot objects. What's happening? You know? And again, it's a good example of how spirit knows a lot more than me when they are sending through the messages because people started taking it and reporting old sunburn coming out in their body. And, you know, unfortunately in Australia, we have a very high instance of skin cancer, a lot of sun exposure, ozone layers being thin. And, you know, we're getting healing trauma, releasing old sunburn, also trauma from fire. In the Middle Ages, like there was something like 10 million people burnt at the stake as witches and 9 million women. So we had, it went for 300 years, 10 generations of children seeing their mums who were the herbless and the naturopath being called witches and being burnt. And people are taking it and old burn marks coming out on their legs and releasing that trauma from past lives as well. And some of these fires, the, the flames were 100 feet high and they were traveling at over a, sort of 100 kilometers now, like for 60 miles per hour. So people were getting in cars in the middle of the night. The sound was so deafening and frightening, getting in the cars, trying to flee, and they couldn't escape the flames and being burnt in the cars. And that, that level of terror and, and counseling, we had small towns where young children dying you know children have been exposed to death for the first time because friends being burnt through fire and the government was sending in the state governments were sending in you know psychologists and counselors to help the people and a lot of them were working the flower essence so we were giving 
um, the Muller Muller and a combination called Electro to come in and help these people deal with that trauma coming through from the fire and the flames. And even if people didn't directly experience us seeing it on the news and that, uh, you know, getting very afraid. And where our offices are at Terry Hills, some of the staff who live by, there was meetings and we have volunteer fire brigades as well as the more established ones doing with bushfires. And they were told, look, if the fires come through, we probably won't be able to save your houses. You know, like you, you probably just need to leave. So really close at hand, people are experiencing that. So the Moor Muller was a fantastic remedy dealing with that trauma and fire. Now it's solar radiation, heat, fire, but it's also dealing with 5G as well, that radiation coming from that, which is having a huge impact on people's well-being. And with, with Chernobyl and Fukushima, the amount of radiation and Green Cross is an organization that's an offshoot of Red Cross. Gorbachev was the, the head of it. And they looked at environmental factors. And every year in Belarus, you'd have endocrinologists and cardiologists, neurologists treating the children with the highest levels of nuclear radiation. And, and these were children who were born many years after Chernobyl, but it was in the water system, so they were getting high levels. And in the summer, they take the worst affected children to the Alps and they'd use different therapies to try and reduce the radiation from them. And they, we sent over a combination called Electro, which has the Moore and Moore as the main remedy in it. And it was the most effective treatment they found for reducing the radiation. It reduced the radiation by 42% in two weeks. And the next best treatment they've ever come across was 21%. And, you know, this is all testing and by said by medical specialists. And as essences come through, they really come through to meet the need of society. Like we didn't have more and more coming through or an equivalent, say, when Bach was alive in the 1920s, 30s, because, you know, now we've got nuclear radiation. We've got more sun flares. We're getting 5G radiation gamma radiation we're all flying thirty thousand feet above the ground in planes so you know this essence coming through really treating so many affected areas and I, I know where you are on that west coast of the states from fukushima we're monitoring all the way down to south america the oceans there with higher levels of radiation what they should be which is going to have an impact on people eating kelp or seafood for example and then being coming up in the rain, falling on the land. So I said, when we've got a need, we've got an essence comes through. So our Japanese distributor was, we donated to them lots of electro for all the people at Fukushima. So what do you do? You get a nuclear radiation. You're, you're living in Fukushima or somewhere in Japan. You can't leave Japan. You're isolated and you've got radioactive water all around you. So it's great that the plants and, and Mother Nature is providing these really essential healing tools to help us with what's going on at the moment. Incredible. And yeah, that speaks so, so well to how the plants support us wherever we are at, wherever we are at, they meet us there. And that is so powerful about the radiation. I didn't know that at all. And it brings up for me these two dual facet kind of experience that I have with the flower essences. And I'm, because you are so connected with them, I'm really curious to hear about your perspective on this. So the first is about more about the studies and the research. I know that you have been doing some research, anything else that you'd want to share about that, because that is very powerful. And I think can really help people who, uh, you know, haven't been working with flower essences their whole life to really open up more to the healing qualities of those. And then secondarily, I'm also really curious because you are so in tune with the spirit and energetic aspects of these essences. How do you perceive the essences really working with the emotional and energetic bodies of the human? Because that's something that I subjectively experience very deeply. And I'm always curious to hear how other people experience that as well. If I go back to the first point about the research, I've trained up a number of teachers around the world teaching the bush essences. And in Natal, in the northeast of Brazil, one of our teachers, Regina Nassa, Regina had a good friend who was uh, head of nursing at the University of Natal. And 
Regina would be, you know, sharing the results they're getting with the essences. And they did a study with six-year-old children with behavioral problems. And they were using some aromatherapy and then the bush essences. And at the end of that trial, the results were so profound for them that the state government in Natal paid and organized for Regina to train 400 practitioners to be using the flower essences. And so the, in poor areas, you might have a, a health center, you might have a dentist there, you'd have some doctors, you'd have some nurses. So she was training all these people in their different modalities to use the essences. And the, the state government was like the results that they were getting, but also that it was a very inexpensive form, didn't cost them a great deal of money. And so Regina was traveling all around the tile, training up the people how to use them. And there was plans that was going to be rolled out on a federal level in Brazil that they would each state would do that training. Unfortunately, they went into an ec economic decline probably about three years ago, and that training was put on hold. So I think Brazil is it's a very heart-orientated country. There's a lot of acceptance of the flower essences there. And again, some of the work we've been doing with orphanages for, for, for a long time, we've been donating the essences to orphanages. We've known some of the flower essence practitioners who are working with the orphanages. And when we started doing this work, on average, the children in those orphanages were getting about six cases of bronchitis each year. And in Chinese medicine, lungs, the emotion associated with lungs is grief and sadness. So these are children, young children whose parents are either dead or not wanting to or not able to look after them. There's a lot of problems with alcohol and drugs, et cetera. And ideally that they might have a practitioner who could make up an individual bottle for each child, knowing the story of the child. And I've been to some of those orphanages and they have like a little roll call in the morning as they call the child's name out and they come forward and then they get their drops. And they asked me if I would, you know, give the drops to the children one of those times. And, you know, they're like little birds coming and, and they're so proud they've got their bottle of essences and they're opening their mouth and getting their drops and going back. And after a year of in the orphanages of working this way, the instance of bronchitis had dropped from six cases per year to less than one case per year. And also decrease the cost of the government by having to buy antibiotics from an average of about 50 rei per child, less than six. So they were saving money. The children were healthier and happier. And you were letting go of the grief, the abandonment, the mother issues, father issues, and things like that. And even if you couldn't get a, a practitioner to go and make the essences for the children, we trained the cooks just to put the food, the drops into the food and these they have sugary cordials and putting them in that. And we'd focus on ones for abandonment, for mother issue, father issue. And um, again, that we get really good results from that. So, and it's lovely. Children, the essences work so quickly on children. They don't have as many blocks and barriers as we, you know, develop as we get older. So, you know, they, they just work very quickly. And then with the animals too. And, you know, like I should say, with a lot of the trauma with the floods and the fires, people would be taking animals, you know, stranded animals to hospitals or vets. So we've been giving essences, you know, for them to treat the trauma the animals get. And, and the beauty of the essence is how quickly they can work. And, you know, things like with the children and, and the animals, it's very quick. And we're getting horrendous floods especially in Pakistan at the moment but Brazil's had some terrible floods and there was a in just outside of Rio there's a town called Petropolis it's a city really and we have a teacher there Vera Gondon and she worked with the Petropolis government and they were treating the people who'd been traumatized and lost their houses and they got an official recommendation for all the flower essence practitioners working with the trauma victims and they had no suicides in Petropolis from people who'd lost their houses or lost loved ones. Whereas in neighbouring cities in, um, in Rio and elsewhere, suicide levels were quite high when people had gone through such a trauma. So it was a really clear example of how effective the essence are dealing with that trauma that people are going through. 
you mentioned how do I see them working? There was a, Garudas was a very early Flaresens pioneer in, in the United States. And I really liked the analogy that he had in his book that from his research, and he was working with a medium called Kevin Ryerson. And Kevin Ryerson produced a lot of information that Shirley MacLaine used, for example, in, in her work with spirituality. And that information was that when you take the flower essence, it goes into your tongue, under your tongue, goes into the bloodstream, and from the bloodstream, it goes into the meridians, and that we have portals in the meridians. And the silica in our body, such as in our nails and hair and in the blood, acts as amplifies and sends out the vibration of the flower essence through the meridians into our subtle bodies. And so if you're very jealous, if you looked at that person's aura, there'd be a murky green, whereas if they were a really kind, loving, caring piece, it'd be a clearer green. And so it's going out into the subtle bodies, resolving it, and then coming back into the physical. And if you're very jealous, then you're going to have an impact on your gallbladder and your liver, especially the gallbladder. But if you clear it out from the subtle bodies, it, it doesn't then come back into the physical body. And for me, it's like if you're working on the emotions, the remedies will work quicker. If you have someone who's got the lung problems or they've got the gallbladder problems, it's going to take a little longer for flourishing because that, that emotion has been locked in the body for a longer period of time. An Australian prime minister who got sacked by his own party and he lost that being the prime minister of the country. And there were photos of him a couple of days later on the, in the parliament in the back benches. And you could see the rage and the fury coming out of him. And then the following week, you know, he was reported he had to go in and have his gallbladder removed. <laughs> it was like that rage. So we, if we can resolve the emotions before they're being chronic, if you like, then we don't get the physical problems. And the essences can treat the physical because, again, we're looking at the causal problem of the emotions. Well, yeah, so incredible how connected that is. And, you know, one of the huge things that, that people have been dealing with so recently, especially over the past couple of years, are struggles around stress. I mean, you mentioned all these natural disasters, just the stress, mm. the trauma that can result from that. And then also as a result of that lack of sleep as well. And I'm curious, what really would you suggest for supporting reducing stress and helping with sleep at nighttime? Because these two things are foundational and primary for the healing process to really occur. Yeah. And look, as, as a naturopath and, and seeing patients, you know, you, you get people, oh, I'm eating organic food and I'm exercising and, you know, doing lots of meditating. And then you ask them, how much sleep do you get? Like, oh, yeah, look, maybe five, five and a half hours. And it's like, okay, well, each person's different, but generally that's not enough, you said, for that healing and regeneration going on. And what I, I, one of the things I have, always do with my patients is numerology do quickly do their chart and I've been doing it you know same times I studied naturopathy and the children born this millennium everyone's got a two in their chart and you know two represents intuition and cooperation but also sensitivity and you're finding that some of the children are getting multiples of the two so they're incredibly sensitive they're picking up on other people's feelings and emotions. They go into a room, they start feeling sad. Now that is it my sadness or someone else in the room feeling sad that they're tuning into. So in terms of sleep, that psychic protection, sometimes a child will be brought home into the home and it's not sleeping and it's you know upset at night and it's got a dry nappy and you know it's been fed. But they're so sensitive, like, you know, maybe there's the, the parents not picking up energetically. It's not a really nice environment in the home. So the fringe vats are nice one for that psychic protection for the children. So they're not picking up things. And, you know, we do a, a spray called space clearing. So you can spray the area to help shift things. You know, you might have had a, a Halloween party <laughs> coming up very shortly, you know, and it's like energetically there can be a lot of <laughs> energies left after a halloween party so people can work with the fringe violet and we have a as well as the 69 individual we have a number of combination ones there's one called calm and clear 
And that's a great one at night because you get some people who are just, you know, something's going on and they just can't stop thinking about it. Maybe they've had a problem at work or they've had an argument with someone close to them and, you know, they, they go to bed and they keep thinking about what was said, what they should have said. Now, what did that mean? And they can't get those thoughts out of their head. So that is a remedy to help with that. And the other type of people, it's a bit like that person I said, you know, who, you know, doing all the right things, but they only getting five hours sleep because they're so busy. You know, they're, they're doing 110 things. And it's like, they're not tired. There's, they're interested in so much. Or they start going online, they find something, go down a few rabbit holes. You know, it's like, or they're, they're binge watching something really interesting on TV. And so there's a remedy it's got a common name called Black Eyed Susan. Now, it's different to the North American Black Eyed Susan. Ours is a very small plant. It's not the lovely echinacea-like Black Eyed Susan in America. And its doctrine of signatures, it's, it's got the four petals, but it's like bringing the energy in because these people, their probably key phrase is, just one more thing. You know, it's like, oh, I'll just do a couple more things, then I'll go to bed, you know, like, Bed's boring, especially for children who are these black-eyed Susan types, because there's so many things they want to do. So that's a really nice one, just to slow down and get ready. In fact, I must confess, that's my constitutional remedy. And when I found this flower, I, I'd see it and I'd be in the bush and I'd you know, have to be back at my clinic to see a patient and be like 20-minute walk through the bush and a 20-minute drive. And it'd be, oh, I've got 20 minutes to do all this and I'm going to be 20 minutes late for my patient. I'm running through the bush. And, and that's when I'd see the black eyed Susan. I'd be really drawn. I'd be stopping and I'd be looking at the clock and wanting to tune into it. And oh no, I've got to keep going. And when I finally you know, made the essence up, the message was, ah, Ian has found his constitutional remedy. Let us hope he takes it. In my clinic, sometimes if there was a cancellation, I think, oh, there's time to go down to the ocean and have a quick body surf. And there really wouldn't be time. And I'd come back and the patient would be there and I'd be coming through the back and I have sandy feet and a bit wet hair. And I'd, I'd get there and my receptionist would leave a little bottle of Black Eyed Susan with a little tap on the shoulder for me. This is take your remedy. So, yeah, that, that's a really nice remedy for sleep as well. And what I find is wherever you get a large group of people living, capital cities, that's where you. it seems like there's so many black eyed Susan types, you know, like they're, they're not good time managers. They're rushing and impatient and, you know, like giving people the finger and tooting when they're driving because they're in a rush and everyone else is cruising along. So it's a very good urban remedy. Yeah. That particular one. And we've made um, a cream from that calm and clear. So that's also good if you rubbing it on their hands and face, but also on your feet because it helps bring the blood from your head where, you know, you all the mind's racing, got so much going on, bring it down to your feet so you just get a bit more relaxed. And if the, the basic simple things, don't watch TV or look at your computer for at least half an hour before going to bed and pull out the plugs from the wall so the you know, electrical radiation is not in your bedroom and don't have a TV in your bedroom, things like that. So... We have a, a, a remedy for children called dream time, just again, to help them let go, get ready for bed, you know? So, yeah, so there's lots of a sleep, I think is probably one of the most important things we can do. And it used to be seen as a symptom of depression. And now we've gone the other way. We realized from research that if you're not getting enough sleep, you're far more likely to get depressed and depression and anxiety i mean they're just rampant if you speak to any mental health practitioner i mean that's what they're seeing all the time that anxiety and depression so there's you know really simple things that we can do and there's also of course so many essences that we can deal with the anxiety and depression directly as well yeah amazing and i could totally relate to what you were just talking about <laughs> you laughing at the black eyed susan <laughs> I'm like, oh man, not interested in so many things. Just like, oh, 20 minutes. What can I accomplish so much? Yeah. Like I should probably look into that one for myself. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. And clearly you are so connected to the plants. And I am curious to hear, how would you say that the plants really support you in your life's work? I can remember doing my naturopathy and I'd been there for five weeks in my course. And it was like a three-year full-time course. And I was sitting on the back steps and I felt, 
oh, just this great gratitude and relief. And it's like knowing I'd finally found what I was here to do. And I, you know, working with plants and flowers really feels that's what it is to do. And I, I know from, you know, many past times working with plants more as a hermit and a herbalist, but this time it's really feels like my part of my work is to share and, and make people aware of what this healing we can we've got from nature and the flowers. And that black eyed Susan bar, you know, I get to travel so many beautiful places and it's, you know, you can travel to somewhere, but if because there's a, a motive behind I'm going to be teaching or something, there's people who I'm in contact with and they will show me their favorite spots. Like we were talking and, you know, you're sharing just how special Mount Shasta is for you. So, you know, like I get to meet someone like, you know, if I come over to where you live, you know, you, you can take me to your favorite places. And so I've had this lovely red carpet, if you like, rolled out when I go to different places, people sharing their favorite um, locations and, and being in nature, seeing such beauty and, and joy and, and meeting wonderful people. It's been um I feel very blessed and to be able to do that and, and have such a wonderful time with it. And I think just getting letters from people saying that we have a flower, Waratah. It's um, the only flower the Aboriginal people gave to the white settlers when they came. It was their highest flower. And, you know, it's a great one if someone's going through a dark night of the soul, even suicidal, it works very quickly. And, and getting letters from people saying that I was going to kill myself or if a loved one was in that dark space and they're here today because of the Waratah. And hearing the stories of people that have been really lives transformed from working with the flowers. I mean, it's, it's such a, a wonderful thing to think that you're out there providing these flowers with that healing ability and the people have been able to get that benefit and really touch so many people. And just that communication with the flowers, like to be out in the bush, sitting with a flower, just tuning in, connecting with it, observing it, just in that that really pure space, nothing else is really going on. You just totally connected there and to, to feel that connection to the plant and to spirit coming through, sharing the, the message. That's um, probably the thing I love the most about, you know, the work. I, I mentioned the Sydney Rose. I made it up just end of 1999. It was, and it was astrological. It was the third grand cross in a row. And it's very powerful time coming into the new millennium. And I'd been making up, Baronia, the flower for obsessing. And I was walking back, it was late afternoon, and I spun around because I heard someone say, It's time, it's time, I have to be made today. And I was like, I never saw anyone in the bush there. And I'm spinning around and looking, and it was the Sydney Rose. And it's the third time where I've audibly heard the flower speaking to me. And it was like so insistent. Not it's now, I have to be made. It was like really important. It's just like there was just enough time to do the whole process of making the essence with enough light to do it. So it was like, ah, yeah, that was, I'd, I'd been to Fintor and I'd heard a, a little flower was walking by and the flower said, hello. <laughs> it was like high pitched voice. And it was like, wow, audibly that the flowers have spoken. But that was, that was quite wonderful that here are the flowers really saying, yep, come on, get ready, do it now. Maybe I'd miss some of its subtle messages and it was like, <laughs> it really grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and grabbed my attention. Well, particularly because you're so connected audibly through the, the messages. I yeah. love that. <laughs> I am curious, though, when were you in Findhorn? That's so great. Um, I, there was a flower essence conference there in 97 that I spoke at. And there was a, a woman who, Marion Lee, who uh, she developed the Findhorn Essences. And Marion, she was Australian. She'd been over there in Findhorn, had come back to Australia. And this was probably in the early 90s. And she was working with me at the Bush Essences. And then she decided that she was going to go back to Findhorn. So I'd been there to visit her in Findhorn and uh, before she organised the Flower Essence Conference. And, um, yeah, so that, that was a, a lovely community. Did you spend time there? Uh, we went in 2014 and I, it was a living dream to go there, work in the original garden, connect with the plants there. That was, yeah. that was one of those, it's a dream come true kind of 
experiences to be there. I absolutely loved it there. Yeah. And the the original caravan where Eileen Caddy and and uh, Peter Caddy and Dorothy McLean did their meditations in it's it's this reverence for you know not speaking just to go in there and meditate and then you know for you know decades people have put all that energy in there and I you walk in there and meditate and you just shoot off it, it's such a build up of wonderful energy and with that flower essence conference in ninety seven it. You know, they they would bring in two conferences a year and there's a lot of important income for the community. And Marion had been pushing for the Flower Essence Conference. And they were a bit reluctant because they didn't want to have a con. They thought, well, maybe there won't be much interest in it. And, you know, we will have a negative impact economically on the community for that year. And the Flower Essence Conference was their most popular at that up to that point, most popular conference they'd ever put on, you know. So it goes to show how many people are really tuned in, connected to the plants. And yeah. So great. I love, I love that story. I love that so much. And yeah, just so incredible to just what can really come through the flower essences with messages and healing at this time. And that it's so needed. And so tell us, Ian, how can people find out more about you and your work? We had the website where they can go to this and there's lots of videos. If you're not from Australia or around this region, haven't seen some of these plants, they're they're quite different, especially to, you know, North America. We've got a a really different landscape. Like in North America, I'm looking up and down, got these beautiful tall forests where in Australia, you're looking more horizontal because there's not so there's more open canopies of lots of flowers and they're they're quite different we grew up in isolation from when all the continents were separating so there's also all my workshops because of covid not being able to travel i put them all as online webinars so people interested wanting to to study more learn more about them they can go more in depth or you know look at videos and lots of information on the website which ozflowers aus flowers.com.au if they want to go and follow through there and we've got you know north america we've got southern herbs in north north virginia where you know they can have access to information as well wonderful ian thank you so much for joining us today it's just been so fun and amazing to hear about your journey and connection with the flowers and the essences so thank you oh thank you very much sarah it's been really lovely to chat with you (laughs) And thanks so much for listening and joining us today on the Plant Spirit Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and please follow to subscribe, leave a review and look forward to seeing you on the next episode.